Hello, my name is Rikjet. And I'm Miku. And we are going to talk about... Some asexual history in Sweden. Yes. Hello, my name is Oliver and I'm a trans guy who makes videos about LGBTQA plus people where they get to talk about anything that they want that somehow relates to them being queer. At the start of August, I spent a couple of days in Stockholm to attend Stockholm Pride. While there, I also took the opportunity to sit down with some amazing queer people and listen to their stories. One day, I met up with ace legends, Rikjet and Miku. I'm Miku and I'm 35 years old and uh, I'm asexual and intergender. <laughs> so I'm Rikjet, I'm 61 years old and I'm asexual. I am transgender, sort of male and all pronouns except she is okay but i was she for 45 years that's enough Rikjet and Miku have played important parts in creating the first asexual community in sweden at least that we know about it started when i joined cruiser an online community in 2003 looking for something else but after a while i was speaking to a friend and I was trying to find a word for myself and I said to him, it must be asexual. And then I looked within Cruiser and found a group that was called Asexuella or Asexualitet. And I thought, wow, a Swedish group. So I joined, I joined that group and uh, after a couple of years, a person in there said, why don't we have a thing at Pride House this year about asexuality because that never happened before. So I said, I'm interested, and then there was a third person who said he was interested too. So uh, we did that. We had a sort of lecture about asexuality in 2005 at Stockholm Pride. And there were so many people in the audience that we thought afterwards that we, we must catch these people if they are interested in more. So we started to have meetings in a cafe, and a lot of people turned up. The lecture in Pride House was also noticed outside of the ace community. There was a piece in a newspaper that said the new movement that shook the Pride Festival, and that was us. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had lectures or seminars in Pride House seven or eight years. After a couple of years with meetings, Miku turned up. Yeah, 2007 was my first encounter with you and the, the Swedish asexuality group. I had seen like groups on the English speaking web pages, but it was like to come home, to come to you <laughs> and the group. I remember the meetings were so warm and uh, welcoming and it was like a little family. I started, started to having like the, the responsibility for the meetings later on, like buying um, Fika, <laughs> you know, coffee and uh, <laughs> cookies and stuff, <laughs> and you know, booking the the rooms and stuff like that. This was before there was an asexual flag or colors or any other symbols of the identity. We didn't have any symbols when we no, started. No, I made a symbol. The, you know, the triangle, triangle with, with the, the rainbow. rainbow. Rainbow like this, from black to white, like that. But you did it because the movement had started with the triangles that was half full. Yes. The black and white yes, triangle. Yes, exactly. The triangle was like this and the tip at the bottom was black because it was just a small part Tiny of the community. Group, the asexuals. <laughs> and the white part were the sexuals. <laughs> <laughs> and then I thought, okay, triangle is fine historically and everything. But I wanted to show that it's all parts of the rainbow and also spectrum, spectrum yes, from black to white. No mm. strict borders anywhere. So that's what I tried to create. They also used another symbol inspired by one of the people in the group. Yes, that was this uh, amazing British lady because she had started to talk about asexuality as being a fourth orientation when she was young. Thing. And you had a badge, a badge yes. with a Roman, <laughs> Roman number, number four on it. Before we had any other symbols, so I had to have something like a symbol. Since then, 
not only one, but several different flags representing different parts of the asexual community have been created. I think we were thrilled when we realized there are asexual flags, there's a symbol, wow! And we also like the colors. <laughs> It would have been horrible if they had been ugly colours. <laughs> this group meant a lot to many people throughout the years. Some people came there and as soon as we started talking, they started to cry because there was so much they had to let go of and let out because they never spoke to anyone before that about it. And some people came for years, some people came once, but they seemed happy about that. Yeah. So it was really rewarding to have those meetings. But then after several years, maybe not as many people came as before. We were like the same people yes. last year. So we was could just see each other privately yeah. anyway. <laughs> yes. Starting in 2011, the group also walked in Stockholm Pride Parade for many years. Yeah, I used to sign up the group for the parade. And we had little... Uh, pieces of cakes, like not real cakes, but we had like drawn on uh, carbon and we had like information on the back. So we, we handed these out <laughs> to the audience. And uh, you were at least 10 or 15 people yeah, sometimes. Uh, yeah. Not just two poor people. <laughs> <laughs> so it, look, it looked really good. We, f we felt small because <laughs> all the other groups are like huge. <laughs> but. 10 or 15 is a good number. Yes, it is. I was so happy. <laughs> <laughs> My children. <laughs> Miku and Rikert have worked really hard to make people aware of asexuality. We have had like uh, lectures for psychology students, students in Uppsala at Uppsala University. At least two times. You and I twice. Uh -huh. and I and another person once. Uh -huh. So three times I think we had lectures for the psychology students and also with the at Karolinsk Institute at people becoming doctors. We were there, you and I once, mm -hmm. and I was there at least once with another person too. And they contacted us and said we want to know more before we start working as doctors. I've even been in Umeå when uh, the hospital there had education days for their staff and they contacted me and said would you come and have a lecture about asexuality and there were doctors and midwives and nurses and counselors and all kinds of stuff at the hospital there and that was amazing but now they feel like they have done their part but it was like such a small identity back in the days i think that nowadays like more people have found the word and uh, that's why I don't think I'm needed in like the community anymore because I have like laid a foundation and now everybody knows the word and can like find it themselves. Not everybody. No, but more people and <laughs> yeah. self the the big LGBTQ organization in Sweden knows it and Evsu who is working with like sexual and reproduction rights they know it and like a lot of organizations know about the word so that was kind of my goal in what I was doing was just get the word out there and the definitions and then I can like, the, the other people can, <laughs> can do their work. Towards the end of the video, they also want to share their experiences of what it was like growing up asexual for them. When I was in school, the end of the 70s and like in the aftermath of the 60s, everybody was supposed to be sexual. I mean, we had uh, theme days about uh, sexuality or being a teenager and it was always when you want to have sex. It was never if you want to have sex someday. And I was like, I don't feel that need. But I felt that I had to. I felt that, uh, okay, if I'm gonna be a normal person, I have to be a sexual person. I have to engage in sex because that is what you do. And that was strange. Maybe not difficult, but it was strange. Mika had similar experiences in school. I felt like an obligation, or they phrased it like it was an obligation. It was like when you find someone and you have to do like this and this to have a happy relationship and also like being brought up a girl, you have to f like look out for the guy's hygiene. Like, how do you see 
if like a penis is clean and I'm like what <laughs> why do I have to <laughs> even think about that <laughs> i'm not sure if i signed up for this <laughs> like and like you have to go home today and like take a mirror and like practice masturbating or you will be unhappy because a lot of women don't have orgasms and you have to like take control of it yourselves because the guys don't understand anything and i'm like this is so much and i'm like 14 and <laughs> i don't know i felt really really stressed about it <laughs> like don't put so much responsibility on me <laughs> and this doesn't sound like something i want to do at all so i had like all these plans like how can you get away with not having sex like can i like just change partners very often or can i say like i want to wait until after marriage and then never get married and, like i had all these different plans <laughs> but i I, I'm happy that I don't have to have all those plans anymore. <laughs> and Rikert has done something similar. Later on in my 20s and 30s, I tried to find strategies. If I have a partner, how do I manage to have sex without really seeing any point in it? But still sort of behave in a way that my partner wants to stay with me. And that was when I was still living as a woman. I was until I was around 45 and I always thought that I needed to find a partner to be happy, to feel fulfilled. And the very strange and curious thing happened when I started to live as Rickert, as a sort of guy. Since then I've never had a crush. No one attracts me anymore. And it's such a relief because I don't have to think about how to handle the sexual things because I never end up in those situations anymore. And that is such a relief. We're gonna end this video with some thoughts on the current situation for the asexual community in Sweden. There's so much on the internet these yes. days. So just search any like social platform you're on. Nowadays, there's so much more. And there are several different groups in Sweden, either asexual groups or asexual aromantic groups. And they are very active, and not just in Stockholm. So there's a lot you can find and people you can talk to. So that is so much better now. <laughs> it's so much easier. We're not needed. No, we're not needed. <laughs> we can retire. <laughs> I support the people who, <laughs> who are finding themselves and struggling. I like one of my friends, we talk a lot. And she is very, very active within this area. And we talk a lot and I tell her what we did and how we thought and I think I'm a better asset as an individual I don't know friend counselor whatever information bank <laughs> nowadays but the, the people who are active they are fine on their own they really are If you enjoyed watching that video, please like, comment, subscribe and share the video. I really appreciate you showing your love in that way. If you also want to support the channel financially, that's possible via Patreon, but really no pressure. See you next time.